Good afternoon, uh, our viewers. Welcome to Civic Space TV. My name is Matanda Baker, and this afternoon, Youth Line Forum and Civicas have brought us a special edition of a discussion on the civic space in Uganda. There are increasing concerns that the civic space has sh continuously shrunk. We have seen civil society organizations continuing to be clamped down. We have seen individual citizens arrested or abducted, if you will, and held incommunicado. The government on its side says all that has happened around the laws and regulations for NGOs is meant just to regulate them, create a better space for engagement, curb uh, foreign intrusion and subversive tendencies. This afternoon, uh, we are privileged to have uh, a very great panel that is going to discuss this. We are interrogating what is the status of the civic space? Can we do better? The direction we are taking, is it a good direction? And uh, by way of introduction, I will start from the extreme right. Uh, this afternoon we have Council Michael Aboneka, an advocate of the High Court of Uganda, and also he styles himself as an advocate, not in the legal sense, but an advocate for good governance. And uh, next to him, uh, one of the two ladies I have on the panel, Miss Edna Namsima, I hope Nisima. I Nisima, I hope oh. I pronounce it well. Oh. A feminist writer, editor, and communications consultant. You're welcome. And uh, Mr. Mshambo Henry uh, from the Youth Line Forum. And our usual suspect, <laughs> Advocate Sarah Birete, the executive director of the Center for Constitutional <laughs> Governance. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, without much ado, I think you'll allow me still start from my extreme right uh, by posing a question to the advocate. What is your view uh, of the status of the civic space in Uganda? Thank you so much. And um, you know, I'll start with a statement that nowadays, if you don't want to develop a heartache, which is, a, you know, a, a synonym with a headache. So you now, if you develop heart complications, we summarize and say heartache, is you, you keep away from news. If you want to have a good, you know, healthy condition, you keep away from news. Because it looks like everything that happens every day is actually telling us the reverse of what civic space should be. And to me, civic space is simply that we have a set of rules, an environment that allows us to participate, that allows us to gather, that al allows us to say whatever we want to say, and that even after we have said them, we are still, <laughs> we are still safe. <laughs> so, what am I seeing today is that the increasingly there is a pretense that it is okay, you can say whatever you say. There is a pretense that we, you are allowed to organize. But in the actual sense, it is difficult for you to organize meaningfully. <clears throat> COVID-19 aside, even before COVID-19, it has been difficult for you to organize meaningfully. It has been difficult for you to express your opinions. The late pastor went to the grave without testing the idea of his expression. He said there is no COVID. In this world of democratic you know, intellectual discourse, you don't respond by arresting someone. Give them a chance to give reasons why they think so. They have a right in their own way to say that. So we are seeing a lot of um, arbitrary kind of arrests because of people having different opinions, people are organizing. And it is true that there must be caps. There must be um, caps and there must be a, you know, rubric set in place for you to do certain things. But increasingly, what I'm seeing in Uganda is that, again, the space is shrinking. Civil society organizations. Now it is, um, it is actually almost a death sentence for you to mention that you work for a civil society organization or you want to start one. Because they have been rebranded many things. So the space to organize, the space to speak, be it for you know, a tax operator, be it for a civil society organization, 
um, has been increasingly, you know, uh, on, a, on a down path. So what I think for me is that many people will say, but aren't you speaking? Aren't you organizing? But it also matters on what you are speaking. If I'm talking about football and who has bought who, there will be no problem. But the moment I comment on a political issue, the moment I speak out about uh, things that affect others, then again you become an enemy of the people. Do you have any specific examples of this? Yes, I think, I think the, 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 the one about, you know, the discussions about accountability for COVID, COVID funds. That is an issue that someone, you know, we've been pushing for it. People are speaking about it, but people have received threats to withdraw their statements. The issue about the kidnaps that are happening, they have been re reduced to say those are security issues. You can't, you, these things leave them to the generals. These are not your issues. So you can't, you know, precisely call on action to someone to say, you know what, the kidnaps are happening, the killings are happening. Can you put someone to order? So I think that we can gross over these things in Uganda, we're okay, we're a part of Africa, Tulambule and what have you. But the moment you don't allow people to speak whatever they feel like, then you are just here, you know, it's just a smear, a smear of lotion. When you go to the sun, you melt away. That's what we have. So I think that by and large, there is a mixture of both. But when you dig deep into the issues, you realize that they can allow you to talk, but it's about what you talk that is allowed. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Uh, if I can cross over to Sarah. Uh, Michael has, has taken the direction of flashing a light on individual responsibility and consequences. But I want us to go a bit institutional now. We know that two years ago, the government through the National NGO Bureau embarked on what they called the validation and verification process where they required all uh, the NGOs registered. I'm told there are about 14,000 in the country. And so far, the statistics I have is that only about 2,000 have done so, meaning a lot of civil society organizations, I know you lead one, you're operating illegally. You, you, you're not operating within the confines of the law, according to government. What does I, that say about the civic space? Yes, but I don't think civil society organizations are operating illegally. Our laws give a range of options that a civil society organization can use to register. One of the options is in the Companies Act, as amended in 2010, where you can register as a company limited by guarantee, and if you are okay to operate like that, you, you operate like that. You can also register as a trustee and many other options. But when you want to be called an NGO, as per the NGO Act, that's when you subject yourself to the regulations or provisions of the NGO Act. And you can do that. Basically, what the NGO Act does, it does not reject organizations, the mm -hmm. NGO Bureau. Mm -hmm. it, it gives permits. So it's more or less like getting a KCC a trading license, getting a, you know, that, that, that's how I look at the, the registration side of, of the Bureau. Because you have to first be a legal entity for you to come to the Bureau. So organizations choosing to validate or not to, I think it's in their freedom as, as, a, as provided for under Article 29 on how they want to associate or participate in civic organizations. And also the Constitution gives a range of options. Article 38 of the Constitution says you can participate in your governance either as an individual or through civic organizations. So the law gives a range of all these actions. But what is the status of civic space in Uganda? I think the space, many avenues of civic space have closed. People are scared of doing civic work. I think it is more threatening than even political position work. And the general environment through which people voice, voice out their wishes, values, and aspirations on how they want to be governed is really constrained. Whether you are in, you know, in a political party space for your participation, because also Article 72 gives those options. 
either through either individuals or through political party organizations. So whether you are in a political party and now civil, civil society organization working on governance, I think the difference is in the name. We are faced with the same or worse th threats because government thinks civil society organizations have too much money that they cannot control. I'll put it to you that they have said that one, you pretend as people who are engaged in civil society, but you are voices of the opposition, and two, that you are conduits for illicit financial transactions. So is there any truth in that? I, I have mentioned the legal provisions. I think it would be more prudent if somebody says, Sarah, you are your own voice, but your voice is political. Because I am not supposed to be an appendage of somebody else. I have all rights to participate in my governance. So you can call me opposition, you can, but I don't have to be anybody's voice. I am my voice. And then the people who participate in the work that I do, they also, they are their own voice. Nobody's a voice of the other. All citizens are equal. Thank you, Sarah. I now move to Henry. Uh, just a comment on the civic space. What are you seeing from Youth Line Forum? Is, 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 it, is it growing? Is it shrinking? Have you met any challenges? Well, allow me the opportunity to first uh, thank the Lord Almighty for enabling us to be here. It wouldn't be in our, in our power that we are here today. Back to your question. Um, dating back to history in the 1940s, after the World War, it was clear that states and governments, which at the time were fully mandated with public service, had failed to reinstate their countries back into uh, where they were before the World War and what countries at the time had lost. And it was clear that that is the time non-government organizations and civil society organizations started to crop up. And their intention was that government cannot individually uh, manage to do that that is required in terms of public service, but also in terms of accountability. And from that time till today is the history in which we move. However, the civic space here in this country is of course worrying just like other um, members of the panel have, have already noted. In this country, it is worrying because one, some of the shrinking, the, 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 some aspects of the, sh the shrinking space in this country have been caused partly by the state. But also, not just the state, but even in the civic space, and people acting in the civic space have also made it shrink for themselves. There is an ongoing conversation about an event that is talking about youth participation. And um, it is very common today to find an organization, to find an, a panel talking youth matters with former youth. And I think for me also, that feeds into the, the whole bracket, the whole picture of the civic space. What would you say to people Uganda? to say, who say, you know, it's about the substance, not the form. Are you not going with the semantics? They could be older people, mm. but when they have very good ideas or experiences about the challenges of youth. Perfect. You have a population of, 70, of more than 75% as young people. It is foolhardy to think that of that percentage of young people, there is not even five, six, seven people who have appreciated the, the matters of young people. And, and then how else do they appreciate them? 
if they are not given the opportunity to talk about them. So the civic space in, in this country is, is shrinking, and that is a fact that we must, uh, we must pay attention to. Thank you, Henry. And that, Henry. And yes. just to conclude, yeah. and that why it is shrinking, it takes our individual efforts to make sure that we can revamp it. Yeah, possibly you will substantiate on that a little bit more, but allow me now to uh, cross over to Edna. Edna describes herself as a feminist writer. And when we discuss civic space and citizen agency, I know that the feminist movement is one of the beneficiaries of civil society work across the world. So these conversations we are having, all the panels seem to agree that the space is shrinking. Mm -hmm. Is it the same experience from your end? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that um, it, it's, uh, it's, you can hardly say that uh, the civic space in its essence still you know, exists as its, you know, its ideal form is supposed to be, which is people organizing. And Sarah mentioned this, that you don't have to be, it's you know, part of an organization. It's not even, usually when we look at, we say civic space, we, we say, okay, CSOs, NGOs, but it's also the individual, yeah? So it's, you know, feminist movements, whether it is a collective, whether it's an organization, whether it's an individual who's, by feminist right, I mean that I use my art, like while I do my art, which is like writing, I do it through a feminist lens. So every part of every story, every person I speak to, every angle is through, you know, the lens of the liberation of women. I'm also operating, you know, that's part of my civic duty or my civic freedom, which should yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, but my quality alone seem to suggest that when you're talking about other things that maybe you could say non-political, like football and what, so one could say maybe like feminism, there's no problem. It's until you point at the, the, the politics that... I mean, that's to assume that the politics, you know, because we, we want to look at, often want to look at politics as this big abstract thing, that the politics does not affect me as a woman, even as a classed, educated, woman on a panel or that it doesn't affect the woman who is organizing in uh, Chiseka market or uh, elsewhere you know it's all these politics really affect all of us and that's why civic space is supposed to be um, citizens finding the freedom and the space to organize to commune to speak freely um, to contribute to how they are governed to how you know they are affected to how their socio-political life is affected. So politics is not this abstract thing that, and it, it, it is not necessarily true that um, when you're not talking about, you know, whether Museveni or Bobby, you're not being, you know, curtailed because we have seen that women's rights organizations, we have seen lately um, health rights organizations like Richer Hand Uganda, we have seen that they have also been put under, you know, clamped down by, you know, either someone or their accounts frozen. We have seen these things happen. We have seen women take to the streets and being arrested and stopped just for advocating for their own rights. So I don't think that it's, it's, it's limited to the politics of who sits at state house, which is very limited, you know, to describe politics. But I think that it's in how anything that, I mean, look at Stella Nyanzi. Yeah, and her poems, and what the, the inception of her troubles, so to speak, is her saying, listen, you promised to provide sanitary towels to girls in this country, so do that, yeah? Was that about uh, opposition and, no, it was just fulfill your promises. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll now come back to Sarah. So. The entire panel seems to agree, I don't know if it's a conspiracy, that the space is shrinking. And some of the nuances that have come through is the fact that there's a clampdown on civil society organizations. So I would like us to interrogate that a little bit more. About three months ago, there was uh, a launch still to do with uh, civil society organizations. And one of the people they hosted is the UPDF political commissar, uh, General Masco. And in his response, he said, actually, whereas we are presenting some of these entities to be blameless, that some of them are actually engaged in criminality. And that if you are innocent, you have nothing to fear. Wait for the investigations. When they come out and you're blameless, you go scot-free. So I, the position I seem to hear on this panel, are you suggesting that 
NGOs, civil society organizations should operate above the law and the scrutiny of the regulatory safeguards in the country? No, first of all, civil society organizations are legal entities. So there is no way a legal entity can operate outside the law. So depending on which law you choose, either the Companies Act or the NGO Act after the Companies Act, then you are supposed to fulfill the requirements yeah, but his point of is, that law. Yes, the, yeah, exactly. Yes, so, so, so are there NGOs that are failing to fulfill it? And if they are there, then what is the role of government? Because we need to look at, you know, responsibilities. Government is a duty bearer, but also has a, a larger duty, an overriding duty, to ensure that citizens are able to enjoy their rights. And that is an under Article 20 of our Constitution. All state institutions must ensure that citizens enjoy their fundamental rights and freedoms. And that article is entrenched to nobody can wake up and change it. So if I have registered an organization and I have stated what the organization is going to do, and that is provided for in the preamble under the democratic objectives, that civic agencies shall retain autonomy as to what their objectives are. All these are legal provisions. So I tell you this is what I want to do. And you license me to do that. If I falter somewhere, this country has a very effective criminal justice system. Bring me to book according to what I have done. They seem to claim that's And what prove they are your doing. case. Where are they doing it? They, we have seen Office break-ins, just since 2015, 42 organizations have been broken into. There is no single report of police. Even where offices have CCTV cameras and the videos are taken to police, police has never arrested anybody. So what investigations are they doing? And we have been challenging them to produce at least one report on office break-ins because we believe that 80% of these break-ins are by state agencies. And that's why there is lax stay at that level. Away from that, they freeze accounts. The law provides for procedures on how to freeze accounts. Some freezing of accounts requires court orders. They don't get court orders. They act outside the law. Even the period through which you freeze an account is, is provided for in law. They exceed. They freeze an account, go and keep quiet, arrange that NGOs are funding terrorism. Terrorism is a very serious crime, our, our dear viewers. If any Ugandan citizen is engaged in funding terrorism, they should not be walking on our streets. The state alleges that NGOs are funding terrorism. There is no single arrest. There is no investigation. Three months pass. The NGOs take government to court. Then government goes in the dark of the night and opens accounts. What investigation are they talking about? Thank you, thank you. I now cross to mm. the advocate. I know as a lawyer, you, you must be very familiar with our Bill of Rights, uh, Chapter 4. Civic space has a lot to do with expression, just like you have highlighted, with assembly, with association. And there are voices, as you've heard still from the panel, that there are now rigorous restrictions on these expression, uh, association, assembly, from where you stand. And uh, we have also had many government functionaries saying that actually this is one of the freest countries in the world. In fact, some say that there's too much freedom, that people have vi violated it and there's need to, 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 to regulate it. That some of the things we see here cannot be even be seen in the model democracies in the world. So what is your assessment in line with uh, the, the constitutional requirements. Thank you so much. And again, to, to pick it from there, is that, and I've had that argument, that actually here we have too much freedom. So then I ask, so is it because we have too much freedom that now you want to start taking it away? <laughs> you know? And you see, the problem is that we are doing, we are managing a country as if we are doing a, a test. Like you say, okay, so how is it in Rwanda? How, how is it the other way? And then try and, try and error. So that's not how you manage a state, to say, if you think we are very bad, you, you know, you go to this nation, go to Guatemala. I know, I have been seeing what's happening in Myanmar, been seeing in the wherever, but the point is that we can't manage a state that way. 
what does our constitution say? That the state's sole mandate is to protect, promote, and uh, ensure that all rights are respected. Now, these are things that must happen and must be seen to be happening. The, the issue of, of saying that, you know what, we need to limit, and we know the, the, the Constitution allows under Article 43 about the limitation of rights and the steps they should, they, should, they should take to limit that right. We're in court over some battles where we are asking that for you to limit the, the, the right to associate, for example, what steps did you take under Article 43 to say that because of national security or because of this issue, we came and told you don't associate. But they just, you know, they just go ahead and arbitrarily say, you can't form a, a coalition. If, for example, we want to say form a coalition of people walking without shoes, that is our right to associate. So they are going to come and say, you can't form it. We have banned it. But they have not clearly, uh, you know, elucidated under Article 43 on the reasons why. So the, the way things are being, uh, are being handled is just a supermarket way of you enter, pick something, pay and go away without reading the expiry date, without, you know, reading the content. So that kind of model cannot guarantee the rights of citizens and therefore cannot guarantee uh, civic space. What I want to say is that the other biggest problem we have in this country is respect for the right to dissent. Everyone must agree with what someone has said. <laughs> that is the norm here. If you don't agree, they even say go and die or go, go and hang on a tomato tree, <laughs> you know? But the right to dissent for me is something I would want to fight for in this country. That have a right to say, no, I respectfully don't agree with you that, you know, that all assassins are pigs or whatever, you know? So there must be, there, there must be that right to dissent that I don't agree with you, but this is my alternative. And that's how democracy grows. The biggest problem, again, Mr. Moderator, is that we are, the Luganda version is better. People call it the politics of Komanyoko. It's a very bad word, but it's a political word. And that, what is that one? It is that you, you, you create a power, and whoever, um, whoever disagrees with the power must go to hell. So, in a, in a sense, you don't allow discourse. We should be in an era, and civic space, freedom of expression, of communication, it is two sides. We should have intellectual discourse, intellectual de debates. When I write something about you in the papers, don't send SFC, write back. <laughs> <laughs> write back, you know, the Kavleta issues. Even when you write something that's not factual or... You know, you, it depends, okay? I have handled many issues. I've, I've helped many Ugandans where, you know, people have published stuff on their websites and then people are coming and picking them. I said, but how are we going to nurture and promote the discipline of intellectual discourse in this country if every time I write something, you threaten me and you, you send, you know, police officers to pick me? There must be a process of, of how things are... Uh, happen. And you see in this country, if we are going to reduce police officers to arrest everything, you know, uh, Sarah has written about this, go and arrest, then investigate later. And then you're saying case backlog. And then you're saying we don't have enough magistrates. And then you're saying we don't have enough judges. And then we are, right now the constitutional court is dealing with the 2014, 2015 matters. You can imagine, six years down the road. And those are issues that we need to be focusing on than, than wasting resources and money on actually curtailing um, uh, citizens' uh, uh, right of, mov of, of movement, of speech. And I want to conclude on this, that if you want to test the, 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 the good governance of a country on how people are managing the, st the affairs of the state, you test the citizens on how they are speaking, how they are writing. A country that doesn't write, that doesn't have intellectual debate, doesn't have discourse, doesn't allow people to organize, is a dead one. You, you're just there as if you are a servant, or every Saturday you go and collect cola nuts, take to a king, and sleep. No, <laughs> things must change. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> and uh, I now move to Edna. You did say in your earlier submission, you, you brought an interesting example of Stella Nyanzi. Mm -hmm. And I want to relate that with these freedoms of uh, expression, assembly, and association. The state is saying, First, like Michael has alluded, even within the Constitution, 
uh, these are they, 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 they are not absolute. Mm -hmm. You know, there they are limitations. So even that very example mm -hmm. of But maybe we should add yes. that the limitations must be what is fair and, and acceptable, acceptable in a democratic society. Yes. So they are saying, even within those limits, that uh, for the curious example you brought of Stella Nyanzi, that you know, as a country, we have principles, we have morals, we have laws. And so when you cross those, you cannot claim your right to, 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 to express yourself or to associate or assemble has been violated. They are just working within the limits of the restriction. Well, first of all, um, I hear that, the, you know, our morals, Uganda's morals, uh, it, it is, I always wonder what Uganda's morals. I think it's, 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 it's hard to say that a country has certain morals for a country with over 50 cultures. Really, it's, it's, it's you know, that's a uh, subject to question. But also where, you know, someone has perhaps exceeded uh, their, you know, gone out of their rights That's limitation. Okay. Yes, there are laws for that. There, there is that the computer, if that computer misuse act, for example, was used, you know, in cases other than when the president was being insulted, we would see that a lot of people would be able, because it provides for someone to, for you to take someone to court and argue why you think that this was offensive, you know? So you don't, you take someone to court, because if we claim that we have, you know, a democracy and all our systems are working, then there is no reason you must pick up someone in the night while they are speaking somewhere at a, at a club and pick them up with a, in, in black vans and take them then after present. You know, you, 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 okay, you can summon them, you can serve them, yeah. but you don't grab them in the night, put them in prison, mm -hmm. then bring that. You know, he, he mentioned it, like the arrest but first. can be effected at night, can't they? I mean, they can, but yeah. also in, in, in yeah. a constitution, you know, yeah, in an acceptable manner. You yeah. don't, where, for example, when you pick someone off the street, people in plain clothes, okay, we can argue security agencies, part of you know, all of these militias that keep mushrooming. But in a black van... Are you describing a security agency like I mean, militia? Uh, I mean, <laughs> we know that, we know that it's, a, it's, a, it's a cause for worry. Yeah. You, ha you saw that in November there, people who stepped out of cars in plain clothes and police, when the OC was, 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 you know, interviewed and said, who are these people who came armed and started spraying bullets? They said, well, they usually come but we can't stop them because, you know, yeah, our much. commander doesn't, you know, we are, I mean, they are in another unit or something. That's ridiculous. We cannot operate like that. One could argue that the unfortunate events of yesterday could also be blamed on such. Precisely. Yeah, because Precisely. Because, sees... you see, we are not free or safe when some people are unfree. So when mm. you put people like these out on the street to shoot indiscriminately, how, what, what, what is to say that those same people are not going to come and target a high-profile person, right? If guns are just given to these, you know, people who do not, they, they don't even look trained because how can you just even come? In slippers. Exactly, and just shoot people, and police doesn't know about them, right? So there is nothing, there is how, what is to say that they, the next time they are not going to use those same methods? Only you. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so Henry... From Youthline Forum, I, I, I want to believe that the biggest part of your constituents are youth. And in line with these freedoms of expression and assembly, we have heard that it's actually the youth who are very reckless. For the case of internet, for example, and social media, uh, the government uh, alleges that youth spread fake news, uh, engage in character assassination and the like. And there are four calling for restrictions, like the shutdowns sometimes, and maybe requirements for registration and further requirements for, for those operating, especially online, because th this seems to be like the biggest playing field for, for, for the young people. So from your, your perspective, what, what do you think about this? What, what, what's your take? Well, I think the, the lawyers, stroke advocates here, have already uh, exponentially explained to us what happens when someone is caught out of the law. And I do not want to go any further from that. 
if anybody has a reason to account for anything, then let them account. If anybody has gone beyond what you think are the precepts of the law, the provisions of the law, this country is a masterpiece of policy. This country is a masterpiece of laws. People come here and benchmark on our laws. And so both the state and the public, we must be able to appreciate the laws that there are. If it be true that young people are using these platforms for, for whatever, is, what, 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 whatever actions that you're putting out, we also need to realize the purpose for which these platforms exist and um, be responsible enough. But also those who receive this, this message the way they receive it must be responsible enough to make sure that the right measures are put. Do you understand what I, I don't know if somebody understands what I'm saying? Yeah, we, we, because we do, but I, I'm, I'm just wondering. That's exactly what the state claims, that there have been rampant violations, so we are shutting down to, 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 to protect. Uh, the, the, you en in, enjoying, in enjoying your rights to assembly, you're disrupting other people's rights, and therefore we are stopping you. I'd rather call these people to book and let them account for their actions. Can I just also Because while Sarah is not abusing people, when you shut down everything, mm -hmm. you're also infringing on her right yes. of information. Yeah, Edna wants yeah. to... So um, it is indeed true that there are people who abuse uh, you know, their, their rights on, on, online. A lot of times, especially this past election, I saw... Of course, there's already this insecurity, people being picked off the streets, and it's scary. But unfortunately, there are characters also in our society who use that same situation to just uh, spread fake news. You know, wake up and be like, oh, this one has been shot dead here. Oh, see, take a photo from 20. 11 of someone and say, look at them, they are supporting yeah, me. we had from uh, police, the famous <laughs> spokesperson, saying some of those images are from Senegal and West Africa. Yeah, I, mean, I, I mean, it was indeed true that some of them were. But you see also, the government keeps shooting itself in the foot because the president got on, on TV, I think a day after uh, the, the shutdown and said, we have shut down Facebook because of their arrogance. I mean... <laughs> So what, what is it? What is the truth? Is it what, um, you know, and I know that we should listen to, you know, the authorities, but when the president addresses the nation and says, well, because of their arrogance, well, because Facebook had taken down some NRM accounts, and the president says it's because of Facebook's arrogance, we can do without them, without accounting for how, first of all, uh, a lot of people interact on, on Facebook in their businesses, uh, how that affects the country up to today, you know. But and the government is also communicating on Facebook. <laughs> and, and government is putting VPN. out true information on Facebook. Well, so the security minister said we can actually do it without the internet. But you see, government is saying on Facebook that we have banned Facebook. <laughs> you see? And, and uh, sorry to come in this. And, and just to pick from Edina, the point is this, that if there are four characters you know that are abusing the platform, why didn't you shut down for the entire country? Mm -hmm. Why don't you pick the characters, um, you know, you know, uh, and uh, go through the process, of the due process of law? And I can tell you that the, the Computer Misuse Act, Edna, I have actually uh, handled other four cases on the same. One being, you know, one that I was prosecuting, I was a victim of it, and people were actually uh, convicted and sentenced. So the, the point is that there should be processes in which these things are done. And the, 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 the law is clear. For example, I keep asking pol uh, police officers, why do people, why do suspects have to remove their shirts? What, what, does, it have to, what does it have to do with, with the procedure? You have arrested me and you're telling me to remove my shirt. What is that? The detainees have rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah? You're, you're saying remove your shirt and I don't understand. Then you're saying, you know, it can be um, a weapon, you can, you know, use it and kill yourself. But the thing is, at what point, what, what is the extent in which 
these things can be limited. You can't run these things on a gamble. For example, if, if someone goes to social media and says tomorrow I am going to do ABCD, so do you use that to do your, your intelligence by finding out whether the thing will happen tomorrow or not, or you switch off, <laughs> you switch off social media? So I think there must be a balance that even when I, and we know we are coming from the limitation, there are only four rights which can't be derogated. The rest can. So, so in that aspect, exercise, th th there should be exercise of, um, of, of reason and rationale, which always is not the case. You can't arrest, then say we are still inquiring. We are still inquiring. We are still inquiring. Why don't you inquire? Then arrest. Then arrest. Okay? It is okay, there are preventive arrests and all these things, but the manner in which it is done. So the, the thing is that we, we, there could be many good things that are happening, but the problem is that we see a lot of bad ones. What can we do when, when you said, but we're also doing good ones? Let us see them, then we talk about them also. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let me on social media before you leave. Yes, yes. I, I wanted to bring in an example of somebody after the unfortunate the yes, demise sir. of Abilga. Mm. We joined it yesterday. Somebody who broke the news of Abilga has been shot. The police was looking for that person to arrest <laughs> for breaking the news <laughs> instead of looking for the killers. <laughs> was that abuse of social media? And then, of course, yesterday we saw what happened. Yeah. So, again, as you seek to limit mm. the rights of citizens mm. to engage as a community, because it's important to know that these platforms, the people who created them, created them for community engagement and association, and they are self-regulating. Twitter does not take two hours without taking off your account yeah. or bringing down pictures yeah. they think are abusive or where you have not accredited the person who took those pictures. It is very fast. So what happens if these program is platforms have their own terms and conditions? that you sign up to as you use the platforms. And to those regulations, enough. Because these are the owners of the platforms. So if Twitter thinks I am OK, I am not abusing their platforms, because they are against abusive language. They are against attacks and the rest. And Twitter doesn't see a problem with what I'm posting. What leads to government to then see it as a problem? And if indeed it is offensive communication, we have enough laws to take care of that as a country. So what is the whole about, about? Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the discussion as much as I'm doing. And I can tell you it's just going to get juicier. Uh, so el we had a bit of a conversation about uh, what the government came in through the National NGO Bureau with a number of uh, restrictions and requirements. And we had a little bit uh, from Sarah saying there are many forms uh, civil society can take or one organization or whichever individual wants to engage with others uh, can take. Uh, but now, before we take a break, we are just going to dive in uh, a, a, li a little bit deeper because, like I did say at the beginning, in 2019, the Bureau came out and set certain requirements in what they called was a verification and validation uh, program. Of course, we also know that in 2016, uh, we got uh, a new law uh, that, seeks, uh, that, that sets in place a number of things and requirements, including you having to reveal your funders, you having to reveal your, your programs, and you having to get letters from internal security and recommendations from RDCs and line agencies. So from the side of government, they say, oh, this is in good faith. As a society, we are growing, there are challenges, and engagements must be uh, regulated. But there are specific ones, like that verification. The, the response from the NGOs has not been as anticipated, and we have seen threats to deregister and close uh, some of those organizations. Some of the requirements limit the geographical uh, operation areas for, 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 for the organizations. So I would still want to pick your mind, starting with you, Edna, maybe on this, to say, are these uh, in, 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 in good faith? Uh, is there trust enough between government 
and some of these organizations that when this information is revealed about your board of directors, about your funders, about your program, could it be a trust issue? What, what, what informs the reluctant response from the, 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 the NGOs and what informs government in coming up with, with these reforms? It's difficult to argue for to argue uh, for you know government and NGOs working together if um, they are going to break into offices, for example. If um, what happened on election day when uh, the, the, the the civil society Observer. observers were arrested for, which it is within their I mean civil society organizations operate outside of the state. Yeah? And part of, um, while they also represent the people, they're also supposed to check and balance the, the government. So it, it is within the, the, the rights to, to, to say we are observing and just presenting the things from independent observers. So when things like that have happened, uh, where you're arresting, freezing accounts, breaking into offices, then you can't, w when you come back the next day and say, you know, here, the rules work with us, I mean, it's, it's going to be a, a hard thing to do. So I, I, don't, I don't know whether then someone would feel comfortable disclosing, because again, it looks like surveillance, yeah? If our offices say were broken into and uh, specific documents were taken, where well, you can't argue that it was even a burglary, where computers were carried and one. What happens if we, if uh, an executive director is taken off the street, yeah, by plain clothed men again in black vans? What, how is the organisation going to feel handing the list of board of board members to the same uh, institution? Yeah. So your suggestion is that there is there are trust issues. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but from Youth Line Forum. What are your thoughts on this geographical limitation? I, I think the, the geographical limitation was a bad thought in the first place because how then first do you determine who determines who should work where and when should work what? And for us, we think that even if, even the process itself of 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 registering and finally being validated is tedious for no good reason. And that it is important for us to revisit and also people, actors, different actors, have a contribution to what they think is the best for them. So the, the limitation for the, I, I think it is on one side to throw out uh, certain uh, actors and certain contributors and that uh, for the, uh, the the people who did this law must have. Uh, I am trying to use very sensitive language. Yeah, sensitive <laughs> <yourself. laughs> I, I am I am trying to do <laughs> self regulation. <laughs> I am trying to do self regulation. <laughs> up until your mind and the heart. can sound very respectable to the to the good minds. Yes. Yeah. But uh, it, it is it is very clear, and we can all appreciate that they did not think in the right direction. Okay, Sarah, you head uh, a civil society organization, mm. an NGO, mm. and if you're not engaged not in... Not a terrorist group. <laughs> yeah, exactly, that's my question. Because if you're not engaged in what they call subversive... <laughs> if you're not engaged in subversion, yes. and you know the work you're doing is for the good of Uganda, uh, and the, the state is telling you they have a duty to protect life and property, mm. and they have a mandate from the people mm. to ensure this space, and given our history, they are very robust in responding. Why do you fear to declare your sources of funding, to declare your work plan, to reveal your board, uh, to reveal your staff and what you're paying to them? Where's the problem? No, like, like Edna stated clearly, there are trust issues with the, between citizens and government, not just civil society. Government is increasingly becoming illegitimate in as far as respect and trust of the people is concerned. How do you get that? No, 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 I, but I've said uh, part of the question is what is the evidence, the mistrust yes, between yes. people and government.
is more than how you would guard your property from a thief. So, but is it possible for an, an organization to operate without government knowledge? All civil society organizations operate bank accounts. Bank accounts are monitored and supervised by government of Uganda through Bank of Africa. And our Financial Institutions Act is very clear. There is no single transaction that can happen in this country, especially the foreign exchange incoming funds. They are created by Bank of, Bank of Uganda. Sorry, not Bank of Africa. Bank of Uganda is the central clearing agency for all bank transactions. So there is no single transaction that the government would want to know about, and they do not have information. So what we so see, no, 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 I'm, I'm coming, mm. Mr. Madreta, I'm first make my point. Yes. So what we see among the requirements of NGO Bureau, 80% is burdensome bureaucracy for information which the government already has through other agencies. The information required by Financial Intelligence Authority, for example, is information that the government of, of Bank of Africa can, Bank, Bank of, of Uganda, Uganda, sorry, can pass on. To, to the Financial Intelligence Bureau, or the Financial Intelligence Authority goes to Bank of, of, of Uganda, picks information they want, yeah. or they, they create a central sharing information on financial transactions between the two, uh, two institutions. Mm. So you don't need to say you are making a transaction of 20 million, bring receipts, bring accountability. Bring, that is intentionally created to waste people's time uh, and, and affect their work. So away from that, it is the, the, the duplication we talked about, about geographical location. Mm -hmm. You go to an NGO bureau, you are licensed to operate. But when you go to the district, then you are required to do double license, the, the licensing at the district level. I mean, what is it? And then these government institutions talking to one another. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and 80% and of the NGO Act is like that just burdensome bureaucracy to make people just waste time in reporting. And that is part of the shrinking space. Mm. It is not that they are monitoring anything serious or whatever. If I have registered I am Center for Constitutional Governance, I declared my objectives to the company, to, to, to the URSB. URSB, and I'm registered as, as, as an organization, and I file my returns. And, I, and, and if I pay staff, I do my pay, I do my NSSF, what other information do you need? Don't you already know who, do, who I employ, what they earn, and the tax they pay? Do I need also to compile this information, which is available to URI and NSSF, and take it to another government agency? These are some of the questions. So but also making, making NGO leaders responsible persons under the Anti-Money Laundering Act is fraud. And it is created through the regulations. Fraud created through regulations. Because if you look at the law, really banks are supposed to be accountable. And before banks clear transactions, they, they are in touch with, with the Bank of Uganda. I mean, what else do you need from an individual citizen? Wow. <laughs> I'm uh, speechless. <laughs> uh, please, thank you very much for tagging along, and uh, I want to thank my panel for sharing your views. I would like to ask you to, those who are following online, to make your comments. I know as we discuss, a number of questions come up, some of which may not happen here, but you're free to comment on Twitter, to comment on Facebook and YouTube. Just search for Civic Space TV and be part of this conversation. We are going to take a break, and when we come back, it will get even better. Thank you. The Citizens Chatroom happens every Friday at 2 p.m. on Civic Space TV online on Facebook and YouTube. We invite you to be part of this conversation. Civic Space TV, freedom always. Uh, welcome back from the break. And like I did promise that the second break will even be hotter. We are back with our panelists. And quickly, I'm going to start with uh, Michael. Michael, so we have seen the various forms that the shrinking space has taken and the various causes to it. But one of the very curious ones has to do with the Financial Intelligence Authority and the anti-money laundering law. There are many voices that seem to suggest that these have been weaponized against civil society organizations. There are even people who argue that uh, maybe 
civil society organizations should not be in the anti-money laundering uh, act as uh, accountable persons after all. What, what is your take on this? What's your experience? Th thank you. And I think from the beginning when this law was uh, being made, I remember we were part of the discussions, and I used to say this is one of the laws that we call the law of suspicion. We suspect, then we come and freeze, and then we go back and sip coffee, and we watch how you're suffering. Then once we have realized that, <laughs> we have realized that you have suffered enough, you have come to our knees, then we say, Nani, open. Like, that's how it is. Because all the accounts that have been frozen, I haven't seen any evidence to say that, by the way, we froze the accounts because you were dealing with subversive activities and you were funding a terrorist, and therefore this is the evidence. Now, for, and, and this is where I'm going to, is that I think we need now to be proactive. If your account is frozen, and it is unfrozen after three months, there is no evidence, we need to sue for the damages, for the loss you know, of, of, of income and many things that uh, people have gone through, so, so that people learn a lesson. You can't f freeze, then later you say, ah, we have unfrozen, we are still looking for evidence. So this was actually from the start, the law of suspicion. It gave so much power to the powers that be mm -hmm. to deal with that. Now let me, let me say this, individuals trade in millions of shillings every day, in millions of shillings every day, be it on mobile money, be it on whatever, people transferring monies and what have you. How come individuals are not accountable persons themselves to the FIA? The bank must, must do that job. The NGOs, the civil society sec uh, sector, all these people that make transactions nowadays, there are few people who receive money by, by cash. Even if money is received by cash, it is noted. People submit payments to URA. People submit bank statements. The bank already takes the information every day and you know, uploads it to the system. FIA has the information so they, so they will know this is how much you've done. So if an individual person does not need to be sending, filing you know, their returns with FIA, for the money they, you know, they, they are transferring and the money they are dealing with, then why do you bog down you know, an organization which is actually run by individuals, the same individuals? So I think that from the beginning, the anti money laundering Act, I know it was coming from the broader spectrum of the international world. Uganda was doing badly. We needed to make sure this thing happened. I uh, you know terrorism financing. And it is time we scrapped off civil societies from the list of being accountable persons or you know, NGOs, because it doesn't help. It doesn't help, it's just too bad a sum. And I think that uh, one of the reasons that's why Uganda is actually going to the gray list is because of also the NGOs, because people are pushing and saying the NGOs are not doing. So they, there isn't much evidence to show that actually much of the money, money laundering and terrorism and what have you is actually by, financed by NGOs. I haven't seen any evidence. So that means that actually uh, that is not the case. So. So again, going back to the analogy, you can't, you know, uh, stop producing because your firstborn is stubborn, and you think that the second one will also be stubborn, <laughs> and you say, now nah, I won't give birth to the second born. No, because you fear to dream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think that that's the point where the AMLA comes. Again, it's still a law of suspicion, and they just sit and say, now I think it's Matanda. Now I think it is the other bit. But later on, still the issue of money laundering and insecurity. We have seen the connections. We have seen people talking about it. The people who man the systems in FIA are not computers. They're human beings. How is our data, how is that information protected? People will know Sarah has received $1 million. And how they use that information sometimes fuels crime. Issues of kidnaps, demanding for $1 million because they know you have it. So how do we get against such things? Thank you very much. And uh, Sarah looked at me with a very curious face. <laughs> to, what, to what extent do these developments push civil society actors and leaders into uh, self-censorship and self-regulation mode? No, I, I first want to, to give a rejoinder to what uh, Aweneka has just said. Mm. You know, there is a, a particular narrative that the regime promotes against civil society. It's a, you know, these are foreign agents. 
these people have too much money. They drive for we drive cars. <laughs> they, they, they are unaccountable. They are corrupt. They are promoting regime change in Uganda. So it is from that narrative that, is not true. that the regime, what is true? That you drive four-wheel drives. If that... I've worked for 20 years, <laughs> yes. do I have money to buy a four-wheel drive car or not? You have it, definitely. So, so do I need to be an NGO if I was at my law firm? Wouldn't I have much more money? <laughs> so, the, the, and, and this is how the, you know, the, the government has tarnished the image of civil society to push the, you know, to, to, po to pose them, you know, against the people. The people to look at civil society as if they have their money, as if they are unaccountable, as if they are using them, yet that is not the truth. 80% of NGOs operate cashless systems in their offices. And the donors agree to those financial instruments or systems in place before even they trust you with their money. Because this is taxpayers' money from other countries. So if you look at systems of NGOs, I, I was telling people and I are saying, we are funding opposition. I told them, look, there is no way an NGO can fund opposition. Whose money? Are you going to get Ford Foundation money and give it to, to, to opposition? Are you going to get money from Democrat governance facility, which was later closed, and give it to opposition? Mm -hmm. How? You, <laughs> you would be in jail the next day. And, uh, and this narrative has gone on unchallenged. As if it is possible for you, because you run an NGO, you are not accountable, you, are, you know you can do whatever you want. Yet there are commitments, there are agreements before this money is given. The same way government receives money, including grants and donations and loans. Mm. And you must account. So this blackmail, I, I know that people, when they have not heard from the side of civil, civil society, they might believe it. Government has used the same narrative to do the security narrative against civil society. Which security does to extort money from their employer with government and the taxpayer? To tell li lies about CSOs? The uh, civil society has $40 million for, for, for age limit. Give us an equivalent money to counter. And then because somebody is interested in staying in power until they die, then you release the money without even asking to say, where is this money? If, if $40 million came to civil society, which agents, from what partner, where, are they, where is the evidence? Oh, and, and that is... So is this to suggest that, whereas we may think the space is just shrinking, maybe it's also fishing, uh, yeah, <laughs> ground... Yeah. No, no, no. For, so, uh, for, for, for job creation and... There's uh, a lot of rights budget. for extorting money and budgets, operational budgets, from a taxpayer. Okay. <laughs> I, w I, won't, I, I won't comment on that. <laughs> I don't know if uh, my other two panels have any comment on this. D definitely. If, if you are to look even at the manner of, of implementation, for example, the Nicolas Opio case, he was in I think about two weeks in jail without any, <laughs> any response. Four days? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Four? Hmm? No, two weeks. Yeah. You went about Italian. two weeks yeah, okay. in silence. Yeah, yes, 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 yeah. in, 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 in a lot of silence. And, mm. and this is what I was saying mm. in the beginning, that when people have things to account on, let, them be, let us be responsible enough to put them to account. Other than causing... Other than causing crisis and then just leave everybody in the air. My hope is that this government, this good government of ours, can be able <laughs> to prove itself. Because they, 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 have, they have a legacy. And unless they are intentional about protecting that legacy, it is going to crumble, which it is. I wonder if it's not too late. To <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, what I wanted to, to say is, um, again, the government, it, it's, it's causes suspicion if they bring up certain issues, like I said earlier on the, you know, closing uh, Facebook because, or shutting down social, mm. you know, the internet because of fake news when before, you know, they have shut down the internet before in, in uh, 2016. In, in this case of, of um, the, the excuses they normally give is that, you know, these 
uh, foreign agents, the, you know, the security subversion, threats. security threats, and we don't want, uh, you know, foreigners interfering. But again, mm. government has received money from foreign aid. You know, we know that that is a fact. We know that so security us. itself, you know, from police to whatever, receive uh, <laughs> four-wheel drives also. And uh, bicycles, but, uh, I mean motorcycles, yeah. yeah, and all of those to be distributed. And there are pictures, indeed, of them receiving. So, what, what, what? That that doesn't, you know, justify the the comments. They are saying that all of a sudden we don't want to receive foreign aid because it's dangerous, and we can argue in another, you know, separate argument. You know, the 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 implications or limitations of foreign aid, but the government cannot be the one to, to make that argument. It's one, because they, are, they also receive aid from uh, these foreign agents, but also because you must prove. Again, like we're saying, you cannot just, you know, on suspicion, we believe that you have this money, so therefore that's, you're going to give it to the opposition, and so let's arrest you and then do the investigations after. Actually, Actually, yesterday, but one, the, the judicial officer handling Nicholas Opio's case was literally quarreling mm -hmm. with the prosecution that uh, after several adjournments, mm -hmm. there's no evidence. No, the but they don't have an evidence, <laughs> 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 even if they take five years. Okay, so this conversation is coming to an end, but so we would do well maybe to stop here. But if we did that, we would leave it hanging and <laughs> be just a pack of lamentations. Mm -hmm. Possibly all is not lost. Maybe there are things that individuals and uh, organizations can do. So this is where I want to direct this conversation to now, that what can citizens, what can civil society, whether it's organizations or groups or individuals, what can be done to arrest the situation? You know that there are legal limitations introduced in the laws we have highlighted, the uh, anti-money laundering law and the, the NGO Act. Uh, there, there are also uh, tactical operational issues and guidelines and pronouncements from the NGO Bureau and the behavior of the security agency. So what can be done? And uh, maybe I, I will start with you, Michael. OK. Um, you know, in the human rights-based approach, there is the principle of accountability. And uh, accountability is the effect that citizens and um, people, groups of people, civil society, put um, governments and institutions to account under their mechanisms. One is that if your rights are being infringed upon, there should be a mechanism for you to ask that they are redressed. You know, demand that your right is respected. If you is violated, go to court, seek redress. Um, I, I've seen a number of people asking for redress um, for, for going to court. We remember the, the, the case of sedition is, is, is uh, you know, the, the, the constitutional court ruled in a different way. You know, it's no longer, you know, an offense. So if Andrew Mwena didn't go to court, then that would have been still an issue. So we can go to court as, 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 as citizens and demand for accountability. But moving forward is that democracy and good governance is about giving opportunity for all, regardless of their status. Now, being in power does not mean that actually you have it all. You are in power because of these guys who have voted for you. Therefore, you are on borrowed time. Time comes when they say now you have to get out. So we have to, to we, have, we have now to start moving as you know as a society where we respect views, where it is okay. I desire to say apart from, from apart from processions where the police band is the one offering the band, I have not seen any that are not dispersed. I look forward to Uganda where you can actually sit down there. An activist Nana with three people, just sat down the road and in Tinder, holding placards, stop police brutality. And the brutality came on them. <laughs> They're just three, for God's sake. Um, I, I look forward to a Uganda where some things actually should be ignored and let people do whatever they are doing. So 
again, the absence and the presence of state. It is absent when you need it most, when you need an ambulance. It is present when you don't need it. They will come and mount pressure on you and arrest you and do all that kind of stuff. Lastly, we need to respect rights. As citizens, we have our obligations. Respect your, your rights, respect the rights of others, but also that does not mean that you shouldn't exercise your rights and that the state, the agencies, must ensure that the rights are respected. We are not in a contest. You are there, you are our leaders, therefore you must do what is supposed to be done. Otherwise, we are going to have a situation where um, people are saying we are tired of this country and then you ask them, but what other country do we have? We are here, so we need to sort this uh, as it is. So let us all raise our voices where we need to be and actually continue speaking and acting on, this, or, or, on all these issues so that we have a better Uganda. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Passionate appeal, that one. Yeah. Edna. Yeah. So, um, what can we do about the shrinking civic space? I think for the citizens, uh, I always just implore Ugandans to act together, you know, as a community. And, and that doesn't mean that, you know, perhaps we don't show up at the same time sometimes and we have, we all have different means of organizing. Uh, Michael and Sarah here are lawyers. Uh, I am a writer. You know, there are some journalists there. Everyone can contribute in their way, but we have to be able to, to do it together in a way that everything, every way in which an, a, a, one Ugandan is affected, it means that we are all affected because like the saying goes, when they come for you, then next time it, it's going to be me. So it's important for us to adopt that culture. I don't know what it's going to take, but perhaps we can start here for those who are watching and just just spread it through our circles and just adopt that culture where, where we, we are fighting for all of us. And that means that when they arrest the guys in Chiseka for wearing red shirts, we speak about it. We don't just slide back and say, ah, no, the NGO's turn has not come. No, that's not to say that the NGOs do not advocate for these people. Yeah, or oh, if they, they are harassing the journalists today, I just sit back and say, well, me, I'm not really a journalist. Or I'm not going out as a reporter, so it's okay. It's important that we all understand that all of these issues affect all of us. For um, civil society organizations and NGOs, the same thing, I would say that they act together, you know, where it is, if they say these, they put these regulations that you feel are steep, let not one or two organizations go and say, well, for us, let's very quickly draft things and put them in and then we shall be safe. Let them work together, let them say no, you know, whether it's, if, they're, if we are resisting, let us resist together because I mean, it's, and again, it's exhausting um, to, to fight, you know, against the oppression in this country. And, and I know these people might be looking at me saying, ah, Edna, how, for how long have you? I think for every Ugandan, really, uh, even the Generation Z. Uh, and, and it's very easy to lose hope and say, <laughs> yeah, that's a fair question. But I think that we must continue to make uh, the state, we must continue to keep the powers that be uncomfortable. And, and one, one, something has to give. So do it together and not give up. Well, thank you. I, I, I wanted to throw a, a follow-up question. But let me let it pass. But maybe just to say, I, I read, I'm trying to remember the name is not coming, of a black rights struggler who said, every time I'm fighting for the rights of black people, I have to use one hand because the other is keeping away <laughs> the other, the oppressed <laughs> who are fighting me mm -hmm. and are trying to stop me. Thank you, Henry. Mm. Yeah, what can we do? Is, is there anything we can do? Uh, to pick from, from Edna from uh, Edna's perspective. Even as the Youthline Forum, uh, in our advocacy and resilient, resilience uh, campaign, we are focusing on, on, on being the lead. Like I started earlier, that um, we need to make this a matter of all of us. 
it has now become a matter of those who are in uh, uh, the advocacy in line with the matters of maybe politics and accountability and those some people have, have called uh, service provider NGOs have <laughs> taken the back seat and for us we want to call out everybody to come on board to come on board and together build a space that supports all of us the other is uh, the, the 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 constitution of the NGO board also needs to be revised bureau now the, the NGO bureau now also needs to be revised mm. and i want to notify all Ugandans and actors in the non in, in the civil society that uh, the NGO bureau looks forward to revising the law and so we need to be uh, our, our uh, attention needs to be high on this so that we and, and, and the other thing is we need to stop living in denial and know that this NGO act anytime can catch up with us and so we need a, to acquaint ourselves of the provisions of the law as they are now so that even when we are suggesting what works for us we are informed of what does not work for us so, so for us, that is, that is where we are. And we want to also support, we have given us ourselves a, a, a target of about 200 NGOs that have failed to be validated. We want to give them a hand and help them in this process. And if there is anybody that is out there, if you are an NGO and this thing seems very tedious for you, we want to give someone a hand. Are you facilitating <laughs> the shrinking <laughs> space? You seem to be facilitating the oppressors. We, Maybe we, some have done so in resistance. We, well, those, those who are resisting, it is also their form of expression. So you, you are complying? It, it, is, it, is, it is not as a matter of, of, of complying, mm. but we need to build a force that guards us from any form of excuse. Because if you create excuses, then those excuses are the ones that will shoot at you. It is just like the people who you point at someone in anger, but the rest of the fingers are on you and only one finger is the other side. So we, so we need to do our best in shielding ourselves. Thank you, Henry. I would like to hear Sarah's thoughts on that. Um, no, I, I think in agreement with my fellow <coughs> panelists, really there are about three major ways one is that we should all challenge injustice whenever it manifests itself. Mm. We should not get tired. Use all means and measures available to us to challenge injustice at all material times. The second option is to be, to rally many citizens to be active in defending their rights and space for, for engagement. Because if we look at civic space as a battle for NGOs, then that alone is a lost cause. Mm -hmm. Civic space is a, a space for citizens, and citizens should not allow it to be taken away by, by a regime in power. I, I wouldn't say that, that, that the government or the state, because the state goes beyond a regime. Mm. It is just a regime in power taking away the space for citizens expressing their wishes, values, aspirations, power given to them by the Constitution. So we should all come forward and defend this space. It's our space as people. It is not space for NGOs. It is not the work of civil society to defend the space. It is citizens to protect their space. And maybe they should be also reminded that as much as these rights are in the Constitution, the acts of the people must speak life to the Constitution. So if they decide to go back and sleep as people, then the rights will be taken away. And the Constitution, I know some leaders have referred to it as a mere piece of paper. And indeed, once we don't speak life to it, it will become a mere piece of paper. And lastly, to NGOs, I think NGOs should remain in their diversity in the options provided by the law. If you think you are comfortable operating as a company limited by guarantee and you don't want to come under the NGO Bureau confines, it's, it's your right. And we should safeguard all spaces. But once you have a permit of the NGO 
bureau. Then that's when validation becomes your duty. But once you don't have this permit and you have not come to the NGO bureau for registration, we need also to safeguard the other space because it gives a lot of legroom for organizations and citizens to do their work. Okay, uh, thank you very much, my panel. Thank you very much, uh, viewers, for joining in this discussion. Many scholars, uh, like Zakaria Farid, have argued that when you block civil means of engagement, the civil society organizations move from civic engagement and morph into some forms of extremism. That's when you see terrorism, that's when you see instability, and that's when you see war. So conversations like this are not to hurt. They are just meant uh, in the spirit that we want to build a peaceful country, that we all want to have a take in how we are governed, and possibly our children and our grandchildren will find a safer space than we are. That's all uh, from me. Uh, back to the management of Civic Space TV. We have been asking them to give us a music show. <laughs> I hope soon it will come. All the best. For God and my country. <laughs>